Section 10.7, elastic deformation. So it turns out atoms have forces that hold them together. And those forces behave a bit like springs. So that because of these atomic level springs, the material tends to return to its initial sh shape once the forces have been removed. Right, so you can imagine compressing that, the springs all kind of compress, right? But then if you remove your hand, it kind of bounces back. It, between the atoms, it turns out it follows Hooke's law. It looks like there's a spring there. There's not actually physically springs. They're super, super tiny inside of you. But mathematically, that's how it appears. So this is something we can look at as the elasticity of materials, the tendency of materials to be able to take a force and change, deform, compress, warp, shear, what have you, but then be able to spring back and return to the same initial state. So we'll look at a couple of different forms of deformation. So one is stretching and compression. So stretching and compression involves Young's modulus. And so that's if you have a long object like a cylinder is a good example. Like you could have a steel rod, for instance. And if you apply, if one end is fixed and then you apply a force to the other end, you can actually stretch the material. You can stretch steel if you apply a large enough force to it. How much force? Well, that depends on a number of parameters, right? So the amount of force needed is equal to Young's modulus, which is something that is, tells you about the material itself. It's something you look up in a table, which we'll see in the next slide. And it has units of pressure, newtons per meter squared. We'll see more about pressure in the fluids chapter. But for now, you can just note that that is the units of pressure, newtons per meter squared. So the Young's modulus times the change in length, how much it has stretched outward or compressed inward, divided by the original length, L0. That's the natural length without any stretching or compressing. And then multiplied by area, where the area here is that cross-sectional area of the cap. So if you're imagining stretching my water bottle, right, that would be the area of the end of it, what you're applying the force over. So the Young's modulus, taking a closer look at it, tells you for different materials how much force is needed in order to stretch it. So if you say want to stretch it by one centimeter, you could put that one centimeter in there with the original length, the cross-sectional area. And if, notice if you have a large Young's modulus, you're going to then need a larger force. If you then have a smaller Young's modulus, you won't need as much force to get that same stretching out of it. So let's look at some Young's modulus values. This is something where you can know that you have this table that would be a reference for you on an exam or while doing the homework. So that it might mention uh, aluminum rod, right? And then you go, oh, aluminum, that's a material. I can look up Young's modulus. And so they have aluminum is 6.9 times 10 to the 10. Notice we then have things uh, like nylon is one of the smaller ones on here. 3.7 times 10 to the 9. It tells you that you don't need as much force to stretch nylon as you do aluminum, right? Or as much as titanium. Titanium is very strong and lightweight. And so it's 1.2 times 10 to the 11 newtons per meter squared. So these are values you can look up uh, depending on the material of interest. There's also bones in here, which is really cool. So how much uh, bones can take compression of supporting certain forces before they break and how much tension the bones can take, how much they can be stretched before they give way uh, and break effectively is part of what it, we're looking at. Usually with the Young's modulus and with compression and stretching, uh, we're looking at the narrow region where it is still elastic and the bones aren't going to break but it turns out your bones can change the length slightly. So there's something to be said for that stretching rack. It certainly helped me get taller. That's all I'm saying.
All right, so there's stretching and compression. We also have shear. So shear deformation is not one where you are applying a force and stretching it outward or pushing it inward. Instead, this is one where you are pushing it over sideways. Right, so the textbook is a great, it's a textbook example of this, where you could have it, you're pushing a sideways force and you can see how much you knock it over effectively. So what we're accomplishing is this change in X on the top half relative to the bottom corner. The L0 here is going to be actually the thickness of it or the height of it, if you think of pushing it sideways. And then the area is the area of the top that you're applying that force to. And just like we had a Young's modulus for stretching and compressing, we have a shear modulus with units of pressure, newtons per meter squared. This is another thing we can look up in a table. All right, and so here are some values for the shear modulus of materials. Great, and here's an example of a diving board experiencing a shearing force. One more example before we go of shear, uh, just out of the sheer joy of it. We have uh, mathematically, you can have a shear transformation of this two by two, so that it still is two by two, but it's sheared. And then we have a sheep and the sheared sheep. <laughs> All right, that gets me every time. This brings us to the end of chapter 10. I hope you enjoyed. If you have questions, please ask away. I would love to talk further and clarify anything that's unclear. Take care, I'll see you soon.